So at 6 p.m. tomorrow at the Okemos Schuler's. The Okemos Schuler's at the Mer Meridian Mall. Mall. Okay, mm -hmm. don't head to the wrong one because they're far enough apart. You will miss half the talk if you <laughs> right. have to go and to people, the other one, as I've done. People and authors have made that mistake. I'll bet that's true. I'll bet that's true. Well, tonight we're going to have an interesting wrap-up. I just got through talking with Angela of Waters Austin this afternoon oh. on her radio show with the Michigan Business Network. And we're also joined tonight by Donna Harden. Deanna. Deanna. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I gotta gotta make sure I get the name right here. <laughs> Deanna Harden. And she's with Band, which is Building Alliances and Nurturing Diversity. Is that Development. right? Development. Development. Mm -hmm. Okay. See now I'm getting all these things just a little bit off. Okay. Acronyms are tough. Acronyms are tough. <laughs> But we're going to be talking tonight about, there's been so much news uh, recently between the um, experience that I went to at the church downtown, the United Missionary uh, Church, where Angela was really recruiting the audience to help give feedback for the mayor's program. Mm -hmm. She's the person that acts as the liaison to the White House, giving them information from these programs that are going on across the nation. Lansing was one of the communities that was tapped to be part of this initiative. And it's called the My Young Mayors? Mm -hmm. Mayor. Here's Young Lansing, My Lansing. My Lansing. Ah, M Y Lansing, meaning M I and My Young. As in My, we all own it, and uh -huh. uh, we gave him a nod by uh, having the M represent Mayor. Okay, <laughs> all right, because the mayor was there. Yeah. And then I went by twice the um, protest that was held last Friday night, mm -hmm. and in kind of a drizzly night, kind of a an ugly night to be out there, quite awesome. honestly, right. on the corner of Saginaw and Elmwood. Mm -hmm. And your group, what were they doing there? On that um, we really just wanted to give people a voice to, you know, discuss their opinions about the recent jury decisions. Um, to me, we had a great turnout. You did? Mm -hmm. We had about, um, they recorded 40 people, but as we were walking out of the mall, people joined in. So some people estimated up to 75 people at the end. So it was great. Did the mall find you a little suspicious? Um, oh, that's interesting. I wonder. <laughs> Actually, the mall, uh, they didn't choose to support us in the beginning, but we did um, try to be considerate and let them know what we were planning to do. But yeah, we were met with some resistance, but we still were able to accomplish our goal. So Band did what would be called a die-in, mm -hmm. right? And yes. then you went across Saginaw. Yes. First time you just sort of crossed with traffic yes. and with the lights, and then you did a die-in in that area. Mm -hmm. And even though well, I kind of worried, I was really my see it brings up the mother in me, the mothering instinct in me. I was worried about you being out there in the dark on the street with all those cars because I know how badly people drive under the normal circumstances. Right. I figured on a rainy night it would be kind of difficult. But you did this, and um, what kind of response did you get from the people? Um, the people on the street, um, some of them were slightly impatient because they were wanting to get to where they wanted to go. But, um, I mean, the response that we get afterwards, um, after any event, is positive. On our Facebook page, people just pour out their love and appreciation for us, you know, being the first ones to take a stand. Um, a couple of the comments on the actual street were, you know, beside the point. They were just, uh, they weren't the rudest comments I've heard, but <laughs> they you could tell that everyone wasn't sensitive to the issues like we were. Well, you know, part of the challenge, I think, when you do any kind of protest is that people end up talking more about the tactics mm -hmm. than they do about the substance of the protest. Right. So tell us a little bit more about what exactly the protest was designed to educate people about. Well, um, I guess the, sim the most similar experience that you could um, compare it to would be the sit-ins in the 60s. Um, it's basically just to bring public awareness about issues. I mean, to me, to draw attention will is the first step to open dialogue. So we just feel like, you know, m making people aware that we feel that these are relevant issues, you know, even though they're not, they may not be relevant for our community, but they are relevant issues for our country. Mm -hmm. um, letting people know that we want to give them a voice or even that we're expressing our own voice will bring the dialogue to us. So the incidents in particular that led to this, um, these demonstrations that mm -hmm. went on all over the country, including here, Huge protest in New York and Washington and other cities over the weekend. Mm -hmm. We should talk about the impact that that will have. I mean, tens of thousands of people in New York showed up. Right. But we're talking about primarily the Ferguson verdict mm -hmm. and the Garner verdict. What we're seeing is this sort of disproportionate use of aggressive policing and lethal policing against African American males. I, that was the issue that w was primarily at the heart of what you were trying to bring attention to, or is um, it broader than that? I mean, those those are the issues that made it relevant for right now but I mean over the years we've seen an increase in um, 
deadly force used on African American males in all communities across the country. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like the blatant disregard for human life on the media is what sparked the protest, the recent protest. I mean, because this issue has been ongoing for years, but it's just the blatant disrespect for human life. And we see, you know, even with a videotape, I think that was eye opening for a lot of people with the videotape of Eric Gardner, even with that, you still are not given justice. So I, I feel like now is the time that people have the opportunity to open. Do you know, um a lot of our listeners might not know the significance of four and a half minutes. Could you mm -hmm. explain that? Um, well, the four and a half minutes was just to signify the four and a half hours that Mike Brown's body actually lay in the street after he was killed um, with community members, children included, coming home from school and still seeing blood dripping from his body in the street in the middle of August. Yeah. So um, it was just to signify um, just the disrespect, like I said before, and um, just the disregard for a child i mean because he was still a child you know it wasn't like he was a grown man he wasn't 25 or 30 he was 18 barely 18. Yeah. so it was just i don't know i just feel like we need to be more sensitive to all issues especially when, when it's involving children you bring up an important media issue and as the former coordinator of the victims in the media program we were always quick to say that one thing that american tv never shows never shows is a dead body mm -hmm. and we never show a dead body above the fold in a newspaper those are the things that are sort of their unwritten rules they are certainly not laws that are enforced but these are the conventions that all news organizations are supposed to follow now there were some notable exceptions when the little baby was held by the firefighter after the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah building when Timothy McVeigh bombed that. Mm -hmm. Many papers ran with that and put it above the fold, but at the time, not all of them knew that that child had died. They knew the child had been pulled from the rubble, but they didn't know if the child was dead, but it was such a dramatic photo showing that little tiny baby in the hands of the firefighter. But what stunned me was I never heard any discussions in journalistic circles about showing Eric Garner's being killed. I mean, it was a homicide. The coroner called it a homicide. Mm -hmm. We saw him murdered, and yet it was as if we would see this every day on TV, and we don't. Right. Uh, was that another part of this? I, I mean, mean, yeah, it's just the fact that we are so desensitized. Yeah. Um, we, we see, in, in I mean, that must be the age of social media. We do see things, and we see pictures and videos every day constantly, and, you know, after a while, you, you become used to it. You become comfortable with seeing that, you know, in your timeline, on your TV, and it's it's when you become comfortable that you don't really know what's right and what's wrong or when you should, you know, speak up and, you know, lay back. I could not come up with any other reason other than race that his killing was shown. I don't believe, I'll be honest about it, I do not believe if he had been white that that would have been shown on television. I, I wouldn't have been on either. the ground that long. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, in addition to the questions about whether he would have been targeted may have way, the hospital. I right. don't think that you would have seen that shown on television. I think there would have been discussions in the newsroom that, well, we never show that. Mm -hmm. We don't show. And I just don't understand why it never came up. I watched Reliable Sources, which is the CNN show on the weekends, to see if they would raise that issue, and they never raised that issue. And yet it violates all the ethical standards that we've seen in journalism. Angela, do you get that sense sometimes that black life is just devalued? Um, I think it's been uh, historical that yeah. that is the case and that we make assumptions uh, about our Constitution and that um, that there is a level playing field and that we all have equal protection under the law and we've seen that these things simply aren't true and that's where we see this breakdown in our systems that we've depended on and trusted and so for so long it was only members of the black community who were experiencing it who could articulate what was actually happening in their neighborhood but now you see it's around the world and there's a cry for justice because the system is so broken that there is no appeal so even though we see a man die it's called murder and yeah. yet there is no sense of justice there's no recourse in fact it's creating an even greater divide between community and police yeah i agree but I, i'm going to tell the story but i can't tell you who told me this because i didn't ask permission to use his name you think today i had a meeting with uh, an african-american male who's 80 that might tell people who it is but i think it narrows it a bit it yes. does but he said you know one of the things that we see as he says as, a, as an african-american male this used to be not against the law right Right. It was. It wasn't even against the law. Wasn't yes. even against the law. There would be. Right. There would be no review in any jury. Yeah. There, and I went. Whoa. That's but, right. Can I lean in and say it's still not against the law? Yeah. Ooh. yeah. Yes. Yeah. When it doesn't even go to trial. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So you see. So he's saying. Well, it's the same. That's what he was saying. 
He's saying, we've got the same deal going here after we thought we had fixed this, and it's not fixed. That's, you know, you, you raise an important point that has been teasing at the back of my mind for a long time. Um, I watch various movements get started, and I, as I was saying in the past, I thought the civil rights movement could focus on legislation. The passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 was a clear demarcation that, okay, this was a concrete achievement that could be made. We knew there'd have to be cultural change afterwards, but there was something concrete there. I've been very concerned that, that I'm not sure about the consensus around how will we know if you've succeeded because I don't know specifically what changes. Cultural change is much harder to measure, much harder to see, mm -hmm. and are there also policy or legislative things? I mean, one of the things you're working on with your initiative that's going to the White House is you've set specific goals. Can you tell us something about the goals that you've set? We have, and so the My Brother's Keeper initiative is really one of the goals is focusing on violence. We, you know, want to make sure that children are born healthy and that they have the supports that they need to actually make it to adulthood, but then they actually stay alive at that point. And so the policy review, so My Brother's Keeper is rolled out as a challenge, and there are benchmarks. Our next benchmark for our community is a policy review. Um, the policy review is really driven by the community and what the barriers are in each community, and it's very different from community to community. The one thing that's really common is that young men of color and young women of color are faring worse than any other population across the board, and it doesn't matter which community you go to. Yeah. So what kinds of policies? Will you review only police policies, or will they be housing policies, all the policies of the community? We are ambitious, and we have embraced all six goals of My Brother's Keeper, and we added a seventh because we didn't think six was enough. <laughs> Um, so there are indicators around each of those goals and a policy review around those goals. So what's happening in early childhood? What are the barriers that get in the way? And that's really where we started. We started with early childhood and had a grant from Kellogg for the past three years to really look at equity and what really prevents families from being able to raise their children successfully. And what we hear from families is not what we hear from systems. You know, ah. We say child care, parent education, Families say, we need a job, we need income, we right. need to be safe in our communities, we need transportation, we need to live with dignity and to have the honor to control and make decisions in our own lives. Nobody wants to be beholden to someone else to make choices about their future. No one. So does your group endorse specific policy goals or are there things, when you talk about changing the culture of police, for example, mm -hmm. what would be some benchmarks that you would like to see changed? Um, to me, um, we went. I attended the meeting, the town hall meeting, yeah, and I did have a chance to um, see the PowerPoint. And the biggest part to me was the implicit bias training. Um, to me, that that goes back farther than anything to me because if you've always been known to be right, you would never question yourself when you're wrong. So um, just just really training people on how to be sensitive to others that they may not understand or may not be able to communicate pr with properly and still finding a way to connect that humanity because I feel that's really what our police is lacking humanity like if I have on a blue uniform it, it's as if I'm no longer a human I am a product of this system so when I'm acting under the authority of that system I don't have to connect with other humans because I'm not a human at this moment and if we could get back to the point where the policemen even if you don't live in that community you at least you know organize or participate in activities in the community so you're at least a friendly face or somebody that they've you know recognized from an event or somewhere peaceful or friendly or open other than just when we have to call you to take someone to jail or if there's a fight at school I just feel like right now police are only visible when there's violence yeah. you know one of the th this is really a testy thing to bring up but it's been something I've thought about a long time is probably the majority of our police in this city do not live here mm -hmm. And I really believe what you're saying. You get, you have to interact with your community. Mm -hmm. you, you don't run out to a suburb and not come back in at night or just on your way home. You see things that right. you know that person because you wave every day. So you know they're not a risk. Right. And I think that's really important, but that's not going to change any day soon. I don't think. One of the things we've seen in Michigan was that when they had a residency requirement in Detroit, all of a sudden a lot of people lived elsewhere, you know, yeah. lived in Detroit. The one house had like 52 people yeah. living in it because <laughs> people, even the police were skirting the law in terms 
photos of showing yeah. that they, they lived, lived there. They lived boats for a while. Yes, that was a, a bit of something. So, I mean, people, th that's the challenge to me in trying to set policy. One of the things that I saw a community in South Carolina do that I thought was really smart was that they took the houses that had been rehabbed and the ones that might be in a land bank type operation, they gave them at very reduced mortgages to police officers. Mm -hmm. So if you were willing to move back into the community, you would get a like 1% mortgage with no down payment on this great house that was given to you at bargain rates. That to me is a worthwhile investment because mm -hmm. getting that officer to live in that community is a critical piece of that. And yeah. not just for relationship, but even for the economy. Well, there's that. It's a huge economic benefit for yeah. that. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. We're talking with Deanna Harden and also with Angela Waters Austin. And we're talking, um, you wanted to say something about this idea of getting police in closer contact. Well, I just think that the biggest issue with that would be that their children have to go to the schools within that district. Uh -huh. And that's the biggest problem. Um, we see the situations where the police are used the most. They're in communities where they don't have the best education system. So when you compare that, I mean, I, it's a direct correlation to me when you don't have food when you get home. So you're depending on this meal at school. And if, say you come late, you don't get that meal, so you're not eating until 11. You're not focusing in your first three hours. Right. And when that child is in a class with 25 other kids, 10 of 25? which probably, right, <laughs> 35, right? 10 of them probably in the same situation. I mean, when you consider the fact that these police officers want their children to have the best education, they know where that best education is. I'm always amused when our governors, uh, Snyder and Christie, anytime they're challenged about their children going to private school at $35,000 a year, insist money isn't the issue. Right. Well, then send your child to that school that's a free and open public education. One of the virtues of having the police officers move in is then they often become agitators to the school board for a positive mm -hmm. change Absolutely. because they do know how to put pressure on the system. And they have a vested interest. They do. Then their children are in that school, that's so right. they care. I used to do, oddly enough, I helped write curriculum on diversity training with Na the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. I used to uh, consult with them down in Washington. We finally reached a conclusion at one point, however, because there's been a lot of focus on training, and I would like to put in a caveat on this. Mm -hmm. While it is important to train officers and to try to sensitize them to issues of diversity and some of the privilege that the white community enjoys, there is another piece of that puzzle. Sometimes under stress, people revert back to what they've been doing for the last 30 years mm -hmm. or 35 years and not what they've received in a one or two or three day training. Mm -hmm. And that's a big issue. Um, one of the challenges, I think, and I've talked to a number of chiefs about this, if you do not have a really tough system to root out the people who are doing the aggressive policing, the ones that everybody in the department knows are a problem, that is what really poisons a department because the rest of the problem is that you know people will identify blue before they'll identify with any other color and they will sort of stand back and let that officer do what he or she is going to do without intervening we need to have more opportunities for those bystander police to feel that the culture of the police department allows them to step up and identify the ones who are the problems and make sure that those are the people who are disciplined and removed from the department mm -hmm. and I'll be very honest about it pro-union person that I am police unions have been some of the most difficult entities to work with because they tend to protect their own at all costs we're mm -hmm. seeing right now that the police union in New York City is saying that the police officers who are killed in the line of duty that the mayor is not invited to their funerals mm -hmm. because the mayor has refused to take a, a stand about whether the Garner verdict was or was not okay. um, the way it should have been. Mm -hmm. That's such an insult that to me the mayor really ought to push back. If I were Mayor mm -hmm. de Blasio at this point I really think I would say that that is completely unacceptable. I would fire Bill Bratton as my commissioner, mm -hmm. I would put in a reformer chief, and I would say that that is evidence that the culture of the department has gone too far in the other direction. It absolutely has, and it seems that there's no community response. So how many people does it take to protest around the world for the system to hold itself accountable? And if the external pressures, if the die-ins, if the protests, if all yeah. the media actually creates more division and more pushback, because that's really what's happening, is that the, the line is getting tighter. It, the division is, you know. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. I see the pushback. And so you're kind of seeing that even within law enforcement, those that actually see that there is a need for change, you have to close ranks because these are the people that watch my back every day. Phenomenal.
I mean, I'm old enough to remember that, you know, uh, if you didn't get to see it in real life and lived through it twice, you got to see it in the movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, where he stood up against the police department by speaking to the commission and in essence, in their minds, ratting out some of his friends and it cost him being shot at by his peers. Uh, quite an embarrassment for the department, quite a devastating experience for Serpico himself, who ended up living in Europe for many years. Yeah, he's back in the U.S. He lives in, like, upstate Vermont or something. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it was an exceptional case of courage to stand up against the system. But I think that's part of the problem. You know, if you keep denying you have a problem, you don't make any, you know, you don't make any progress. And some police agencies are in denial. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, they forget the fact that the police uniform, it's a brand. So even though every community doesn't have the same issues, but they still identify the police officer with whatever's going on in New York, whatever's going on in Missouri, you are a police officer. So to me, that, that means that you have a connection to this situation, whether it's directly or indirectly. And I feel like by not addressing it, um, you open up more room for suspicion because it's like if you don't take a stand for or against it you're either saying that we can't say anything because we might have a few of those in our department or we can't say anything because of other departments that um, where we have an alliance with so it, it, it just it just it builds up the mistrust between the community members and the police officers when you don't say anything we heard the other night at the church the idea that if you really want police want to be protected, they need to have that confidence of the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have people who really mistrust them, I mean, that puts them at risk. Right. So it should be to their distinct advantage. I'm concerned to hear about that pushback, though. What strategies do you think are the most effective, Angela? What What do we have to do to, to get positive change flowing in the right direction? You're such an optimist. You're always... I am optimistic. I think what these young ladies are doing by applying the visible pressure, by keeping it in the forefront, is absolutely necessary. The relentless protest around the world, every day I wake up and I say, okay, as long as you're still out there, I can go in there. Ah. Because the pressure has to happen from the top and it has to come from below and it has to come from every side. And all of these things have to happen simultaneously. There is not one solution, not one strategy, not one person. It all has to happen together for this to move. I like that idea that it really has to be a multi-pronged strategy with different different tactics along the way. Absolutely. And um, I mean, the more we see people coming out and trying to pour out their emotion and their opinions about the situation, I realize that it's bigger than just the movement, the civil rights movement. It's it's just human rights, period. Yeah. Because there are so many interchangeable issues that we have to deal with. I mean, just the I mean, just sexism. You know, racism, classism, there's so many, so many different levels of division. And as black women, I feel like we are at the bottom of the totem pole. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. but we it gives us a unique perspective. Right. At the march. Yeah. Right. I mean, it gives us a unique perspective, though, because if you think about it, we are also the mothers of the children of the next generation. Yeah. So I just feel like we have the voice that people will listen to because we really have the experience of the injustice, of the mistrust. But Bill was saying today, we're hearing women's voices in this movement a lot more yeah. strongly and clearly than we're hearing some of the men's voices. Men's voices right are, yeah, they're invisible right now. I mean, I don't mean to make a reference to James Baldwin, <laughs> but they're definitely invisible, and I think that's something has to happen about that. Well, one thing I can say about the black women being so boisterous now, I mean, to me, one thing I learned about the Angela Davis case was that they will not kill a black woman, not an intelligent one. They will kill black black men because oh. they're dispendable. But a black woman who is educated and not afraid to speak for what is right will have a following and will have people on the outside and in the inside who, who will root for her. So I, I so feel you like think she had a certain level of protection by being female. Yeah, and, oh. and being intelligent and willing to put herself mm. on the front line. Mm. Because you don't you don't find that often a black female who is willing to be just be careful and don't push it too far. <laughs> right, <laughs> we right. don't want to find out that they're willing to make an exception. Right, right, <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, I just feel like um, even when we were speaking with the mayor, it, it's almost like people are amazed that we actually have opinions that that make sense and we can. I don't know. It's just like it, it's amazing to people to hear a black woman, a young black woman, actually have a stance and can support it and act upon the opinion You've been and invisible yeah i mean you really have been invisible you've been erased in a yeah. lot of situations mm -hmm. where we haven't heard your voices and i think that's part of what i found really interesting and exciting about this movement and i'm happy to see all the generations coming together mm -hmm. i don't see it as a divisive one where the sort of the gray beards of the movement
movement say, oh, those young people, they're off track. No, I think everybody's saying we all have a contribution to make, and that's wonderful to see. And we've never stopped protesting. And so yeah. I'd just like to kind of do the math, do the math. Look how many centuries we practiced structural racism. Yeah. We perfected it. The system is producing exactly what it was designed to produce. You so, scared me today when you told me this. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a perfect system. It's working really well for those it was designed to work for. It is. So we're indeed. expecting a system to produce something it was never designed to produce. And we've seen so much of this, the progress from the civil rights movement actually be rolled back. Yes. Even to the point that the right that children don't have a right to education. Let's not look at Brown v. Board. Yes. Let's not look at the civil rights amendment. Let's look at legislation from 1979 and uphold that. Isn't so that? whenever there's the possibility where policy can undermine, Michigan being proposal to the fact that I can't say I have a program for black males is a problem. So even when you have huge disparity, the law has made it possible to actually intentionally and focus the redress. So even the My Brother's Keepers language is watered down. I agree. I agree. And it's, I think part of it is that the left has been timid. Uh, they felt they made gains and then they had to protect them. And any time you're in a defensive position, you're just trying to protect what you have instead of going for a greater vision. Mm -hmm. I think you're not very inspiring and I think you're going to lose what you're hanging on to. Mm -hmm. well, so This is interesting. I, I don't know if I told you about this, Angela, when I was talking to you earlier, but 19, um, next year, 2015, represents three significant civil rights things that happened here in, in this mm -hmm. community. One, well, one happened outside the community, but it happened to somebody who was part of this community. At a, uh, February 11th is the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King speaking at MSU. It was a major speech he made, and because of that, about 200 MSU students went south. Three summers in a row. February 21st of 1960. For the Freedom Rides. Not Freedom Rides. Freedom Ed Park was the year after, and they went south to do educational programs in the schools. Okay. They set up Freedom Schools. Freedom Schools. Which were just as dangerous. Oh, because bad. several people got killed going to Freedom Schools. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing that happened is February 21st of 65, Malcolm X was assassinated. That was, I think that's a major thing in this country for and outside this country. People know, all know about that. Yeah. And then you, you rush forward to May 25th of 1965. 60, about 60 people got arrested on the streets of Ann East Lansing demonstrating for open housing. That's they did a sit-in in 1965. 60 people were arrested. John Hanna, the president of the university at, time, at that time, provided the buses to take them to jail. Mm. Wow. Mm. So you got a few things looking at. I'm not suggesting anything. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but we were sitting in in the 90s on U of M's campus, right. so this idea of protest and civil disobedience is something that has never stopped. No, it probably shouldn't. Because we haven't seen the results of it yet. Yes, yes, it's the benchmarks that's waiting to see that. Let me get this in. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. We're talking with Deanna Harden of BAND, which is Building Alliances and Nurturing Development, and Angela Waters Austin, who is with my uh, young mayor. Well, I'll say I'm with One Love Global. You're One Love Global, One Love Global, which CEO is a 501c3, and yes. we are the convener for our local My Brother's Keeper initiative. Yes. And you were going to chime in with something there. Um... Let me find out something. We were you the person I couldn't I couldn't turn around fast enough. There was some discussion on what I'd like to move to. Angela and I were talking today about the school to prison pipeline. And were you the person who talked about doing some uh, substitute teaching? Mm -hmm. Yes. And how when you walk into a classroom as a substitute, you find a list on the on the desk. Yes. Tell us about that list. Um. So um, I was discussing the implicit bias training, and yeah. I, I suggested that that be required for educators as well as police officers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just walking into a class of thirty-five and having a list of six or seven all black male students, and having a note. You know, if they talk too much, send them out. If they disrupt you, send them out. And it, and that's what it is. So not only are we letting them know from a young age that they're bad, but we're also cutting into their education time. Right. So they spend so much time in the hallways with the behavior specialists. They they never really learn one how to become a student right. and two how to learn how to teach themselves how to learn because you have to have both sides. You have to be able to sit in class quietly and you know follow instruction but you also have to know how to look at a piece of information and internalize it for yourself. And I feel like black men are pushed 
to the boundaries of the classroom in every level. So when you get to kindergarten, I mean, there's no reason why a kindergarten should be expelled or suspended. Right. It starts in preschool. 91% yeah. of the children expelled from preschool are black boys. 91%. What? That's horrific. But just to say the word expelled and, and to be talking about a five-year-old, I mean, how, how do you even, that word sounds too large to be speaking to a five-year-old about. Mm -hmm. I talked to a legislator probably 35 years ago, and one of the things he said was that when you look at our educational system, it serves males so poorly by really putting a high premium on things like sitting quietly with your hands in your lap right. and not moving around much. And we know that just the gender differences, yes, there are more differences within a sex than there are between them in many cases but the reality is is young boys don't sit still very long right. I mean right. so now we've medicalized that and we have also you know big farmer comes in and make sure that you have to have drug testing and put them on drugs for this and then you have but it really bothers me that there would be a list waiting on the table for that mm -hmm. a substitute teacher mm -hmm. identifying black males as the problem in the classroom is that part of the failure of teaching teachers how to teach I think it's the failure of teaching teachers how to be sensitive to the different situations that they have in their classroom. Yeah. Um, because when you get into the classroom, for me, I immediately introduce myself to those students because to me those are the students who don't get any of your attention who don't get you know help with their assignments or get that one-on-one -on -one time too so to me that makes me want to pour into them more because I know you know sitting on the other side not too long ago as a student I know the type of you know behavior that can come from being isolated or being ignored yeah so um, and I, I think that a, a lot of the behavior issues are agitated by educators I do too. Yeah. And I think we don't teach maybe strategies that would help people. And first of all, is being willing to tolerate a higher level of noise and right. disruption in a classroom. I think kids, you know, need opportunities to blow off a little steam. Right. That was the whole idea when I was a kid by sending kids out for recess and PT. It wasn't necessarily to try to keep us fit. It was so that we wouldn't be bouncing off the walls during the time they were, we were supposed to be studying spelling, you mm -hmm. know. Right. <laughs> it seems to me we've lost all of that in so many of our schools. We have. It's about control. It's from Detroit. And first of all, you face a huge cultural shock just coming from a large city mm -hmm. where you have gone to schools where a lot of people look like you to mm -hmm. coming to a school where almost nobody looks like you. And you're put in these large classrooms of three, four, five hundred students. You've never been in an environment like that before. And it just seems so overwhelming. And I really thought that touched a real nerve with me because I don't know how we express enough love and say, you know, we love having you here. This is wonderful. Let's talk and let's you know let's learn from each other and I don't know how we do that institutionally how do we make those kinds of changes as teachers um for me it would like I was saying about the police officers having teachers who live in the community who mm -hmm. are familiar with your mom you know who who knows whether or not your mom can afford eggs or bacon or orange juice mm -hmm. I mean knowing the the individual as well as knowing the type of student they are will help you to really bridge the gap because a lot of times kids I mean it, like for me, if I was a ter uh, permanent long-term sub um, before, and just bringing granola bars, uh -huh. I mean, just or giving them an apple, or just knowing that, letting them know if if you are hungry, you can come to me, or or if you need a ride home, you can come to me, or just letting them know that you're there, because a lot of them are being raised by someone who was probably not an adult when they had them, so you are. It's kind of like the only authority figure you have is your teacher because you don't really see your mom as an adult. You see her as a kid. So when you're told by the authority figure that you're bad and then you go home and your mom doesn't have time for you, it's, it's, you're constantly being told that you're not wanted. So when you're told that you're not wanted, you, you kind of accept that and internalize that and you begin to act out that. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is mm -hmm. indeed. Yeah. Angela, you've been around and you've seen policy issues so much. What is it that's been rolled back that I think one of the things that really worries me is hunger among young people. Mm -hmm. We now see, my sister does a program in Grand Ledger that she launched the backpack program for food for kids on the weekend because 40% of the kids are on some sort of federal support for food and that's in an affluent suburb like Grand Ledge. And at the same time, you know, so they have the backpack program so kids will get food over the weekend. We kind of had that problem licked. 
And now it's rolling backwards. We're seeing more and more hunger in the community. We're seeing uh, fewer and fewer support systems. What kind of institutional problems are there that we need to be, how do we move? How do we change this? I think it's the moving thing simultaneously because we tweak a thing over here, but we don't pay attention to what the effect is going to be over there. And what I've been longing for is someone who's much smarter than me to come up with a way to simulate the impact of a policy before it's made. <laughs> I know. And see all the <laughs> <laughs> That's my dream. A nice little computer simulation that says, and here's how this one's going to go wrong. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh -huh. You know, because things that seem really smart on the front end, and I th and so I would, I would like to believe, and you're right, I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful. I would like to believe that if people knew the thing to do, they would do it. And I believe you're, I think it's part of it is that people don't know what to do. I don't want to assume that people don't care about that kid. I know you care about that kid. So you care about children. I think that a lot of times we just don't know, and when you're in a position where you're supposed to be the authority, you don't really have the latitude to say, I don't know. If I say that I don't have a clue what I'm doing to produce these <laughs> outcomes, my check is not going to come. That's true. We have to be very confident about how this is going to be the best program you've ever seen. That's how you get the grant. And you get the low-hanging fruit so that yeah. you can demonstrate your success, so you bring in the kids who are going to do well. Yep. You're not going to go for those who are struggling, those who That's are the worst affected. You should run a charter school. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's how that uh, system works. You know, something that, and I think there's yeah. little things, they're not little to some people. And I was listening to a conversation that, probably on NPR, I doubt it was on Tim Barron's show, about um, what happens when you call school off because of weather. Right. Oh, yes. I the impact on, disparate impact on I different families. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. no mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Holy cow! Right. Yeah, that's a big, big deal. Or you that's have right. to spend the dollars you had left that exactly. were earmarked for something else. They have to be moved. Right. You don't get a coat. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Yes. So I mean, there's a lot of education. And if you have to be home with that child and miss work, mm -hmm. do you lose your job? Yeah. Are you docked from your job? If you're a salaried employee in an upper middle class job, the chances are that that's fine. You know, yeah. well, there's been a family emergency. Mm -hmm. If you're working at a minimum wage job, the chances are you could be very, very vulnerable, and that could be the end of your opportunity. Absolutely. Well, I went down to the avenue when some young women came in, and many of them were African American, talking about the minimum wage issue. Mm -hmm. And I was very struck by Donetta Hill, who came out of Detroit and she had worked for one of the fried chicken franchises right and she was talking about how by just coming there she was likely to face retaliation and she did she didn't have a job when she went back mm -hmm. and it's made it so difficult when we see the kinds of protests taking places across the country now I mean it's a brave thing to do it still is very difficult for people to be able to protest and not pay really awful consequences right. for it. Yes. So you see the chief who has been out protesting and holding up the Black Lives Matter sign and his union oh. is organizing against him. Yes. He's their boss. You know what I mean? He is the boss of all of those people that belong to that union, but it seems that the union has more power than he does. And so you have a chief who clearly sees that something is wrong. Wants to make But change. he is not able to affect the culture in his own institution. I'll tell you what really kind of gave me pause is that our legislators join the protest. Yes. That's interesting. Isn't I'm it? thinking, go back in there and change this. Yes. You're in the place where you should be able to do something about that. If you can't do something about this, what is this really all about? Yes. And I think that is the disconnect between um, the community and the government. A lot of people in the community aren't really aware of h how their vote is, is relevant. Right. Mm -hmm. um, even for me, being a young adult, I didn't even realize the effect that my vote had on the primaries. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I didn't I didn't even realize that until this year that it really directly affects any law that I, I want to be passed probably in the next 15, 20 years. Right. And for me to not know that, I can just imagine how many other people in this community didn't know that. Mm -hmm. When I heard the president say that two-thirds of the country didn't vote, right. and then, I mean, for me, the protests are coming now, but it's like we still have to get in and fight fight for these positions back to even make the change that we're talking about on the street, you know, actually in the bills. Like, we don't have the people in power right now to even make those changes. So we're starting from the bottom. Like, we need to first try to fund new representatives, um, get them to have enough backing in the government to even make enough noise for people to support them. And I mean, it's, it's just so many levels to having your voice heard that I don't think people are aware of. And it's probably intimidating when you really think about 
how little we really matter to those who are really in power. Well, one of the reasons we may not be hearing black voices, black male voices as much in the movement now is that we have criminalized so many of them. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about the other day is that in a previous era, we were all trying to encourage local governments. They were giving special extra points on civil service for those who were returning Vietnam vets. So it shows you how, how old I am, right? But I also thought that what we should be doing is taking the young people who came out of the most distressed neighborhoods and giving them a priority. If they were willing to go into the police departments and be the police officers for their own communities, they should get extra points. Mm -hmm. But what we've done in the meanwhile is that so many of them now have some sort of record, either mm -hmm. as a juvenile or as an mm -hmm. adult. We're reaching a point where one out of four, maybe one out of three in the near future, African-American males will have some sort of criminal record. That takes them out of the running for voting in many states. Mm -hmm. It means they have no political power. It means that they can't go ahead and move into office to change the laws. It totally divorces them from the political system. And I think you're, you know, maybe part of what we're seeing is that they feel defeated, that there's no point, there's no place for them in the system anymore, except to be the raw material that goes into the for-profit prisons. Mm -hmm. Again, I say the system is working perfectly as designed. Ah. Yeah, it's working at, six, I saw an article the other day, 60-some percent of HR executives check backgrounds and all those things are going to turn up. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and when um, I was just thinking, when I was in line um, during the midterms, there was the majority of the, the people in line was Caucasian female. Yeah. Like there weren't a lot of black females. There weren't a lot of white males. There were no black males, but there was, um, I think, older Caucasian females. Interesting. So that just shows you who is aware of what power they hold. Right. We don't, I mean, I voted because I wanted to make sure that my voice was heard. I didn't even think, I mean, I, I still don't think that my vote really counts. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, know I just feel intimidated. Exactly. But, but when you see Caucasian women come, showing out in numbers, they know that their vote counts. They know that their opinion is going to be heard. And, and that's really what's lacking. We don't have the confidence in our government. That's part of the disconnect. And you know, when Angela keeps talking about how that's the way the system is supposed to work, well, when we see a greater and greater percentage of people who stay home because they feel there's nothing in it for them, right. that that's, they're not part of that system, that they can't really be heard in that system, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that then you don't have any part in that right. system. Well, some of us feel like we went to the polls and we still didn't get what we voted for. I won't mention names about that particular election. Ah, uh, yes, that has been a, a challenge, hasn't it? Yes, and it even has. that situation, it just it just showed me that we really have to be on the front lines, making sure everyone in our neighborhood is registered, making sure that everyone knows, you know, where their um, their location is and what time the uh, polls open. I just feel like the information is not circulated as broadly as it should be, or people are not as enticed to participate as they should be. And we've seen the rollback in voter registration. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that is, was to me an absolute shocker. I was uh, become an issue again a while ago. So this is the first year that we actually went out and did get out the vote. Did you? Yeah, and um, partnering with student organizations at MSU who had the energy to actually get out and do the legwork and um, and just the resistance, like people, just the, the sense of it doesn't really matter what I do. I am assuming, am I correct in this, that we've just been joined by a new guest. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. Are you Ray Paris? I am. I am glad to meet you. And we were talking earlier about the blog posting that you had, and we were talking about how it was an open letter to black students telling them how you love them and how their lives matter. And I wondered if you could recapitulate for us how that uh, blog post happened and what's happened since then. Sure. You know, there are always a lot of things <laughs> that go into it, but the most immediate was after the grand jury refused to invite, indict um, Mike Brown's murderer. Um, I started thinking about a possible response from black professors, and then not long after that, um, there was the Art Eric Garner um, grand jury decision. And, and so that day I started writing, and and then the next day, MSU held a town hall after Ferguson, um, which was great because it created a space where students could tell their stories and just talk about some of the things that have been happening. Um, and, and a space for faculty too. And so to hear mm -hmm. black faculty and black students yeah. share just some hard stories. Um, and so 
I told black faculty who had attended the, the event that I had written a letter and that I was going to contact them, worked on the letter a little bit more. Um, and then on Saturday, black students had organized a march um, a protest and so did Diane's in front of the Breslin um, on Grand River. And I brought the letter with me, didn't know if there was going to be a moment um, and didn't want professors' voices to take the place that yeah. students were organizing. Um, and then there was a moment in front of Beaumont Tower and so read it to them there. And at that point we had already sent it out to a core group of professors mm -hmm. across the country um, to get some signatures so that we had those signatures when we would post them. Um, and then after the march, worked on it a little bit more, and we wanted to get it out Monday morning. And so um, Jessica Marie Johnson, who's a professor in history, did some like late, <laughs> late <laughs> Sunday night, early Monday morning mm -hmm. organizing, just amazing organizing, sent it to Brittany Cooper, Mark Anthony Neal, um, Tamara Lomax, who does the Feminist Wire, um, who else, Trevor Lindsay, uh, and I'm forgetting someone else. Um, and so these people have huge platforms. And so they also posted it in places. And so posted it Monday morning and it took off. Um, and mm -hmm. around the same time other things were happening, uh, a black student had come into my office and talked to me about some things that were happening in one of his classes. And he wasn't the first student and he won't be the last, unfortunately. Um, and so that happened. And then also there were two black professors, Kiese Lehman and Eve Dunbar at Vassar College who published essays around the same time about mm -hmm. being a black professor and administrator at Vassar College and the difficulties of that. Um, and so there were a lot of, of things happening. And so the letter was posted on Monday and I thought some people might sign it. <laughs> um, but the response has been um, mm -hmm. Just unbelievable, unbelievable, overwhelming, amazing. Um, like How long have you taught at MSU? This is my fourth year. Your fourth year, yes. because I wondered. I've been. Oh, I'm really, really old. I've been here forever, <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing. I'm seeing so much of the impact of the MCRI that passed in this state, in terms of not seeing as many students of color at MSU and not mm -hmm. seeing the sort of rich. Mm -hmm. tradition that we had going at the university, it's made it so much more difficult for students to be able to get into the university, it seems to me. And the astronomical rise in costs of tuition mm -hmm. that are just excluding more and more families that make it so difficult for people. I mean, they're looking at staggering amounts of debt and can we even borrow enough to be able to send a student to, uh, you know, to school. I'm wondering, how do, what can the faculty do? How can we help? We need to be able to express love to the students that get here. How do we get more of them here? I'm going to turn this over to Django. Okay, to... Django, if you would introduce yourself. And we have to get real close to the mic, about an inch away. Sure. So uh, Django Paris, Associate Professor in Education at Michigan State. Um, I mean, that's, you know, it's a, it's a big, it's a real big question. When, when, uh, when Ray and I were undergrads at Berkeley, um, a few years back in the um, late 80s, early 90s, um, it was about $1,200 a semester to go to Berkeley. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's changed some. And then we had in California, you know, where we're both from, uh, Prop 209, which um, uh, did away with affirmative action. And we saw a campus that was, was fairly racially and ethnically diverse become one that wasn't. Um, and so it sounds like, you know, like, you know, what you're talking about is, 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 is sort of um, Michigan's version um, of that um, yes, it was horrible story. patterned exactly on what happened. Yeah, right. And so, um, so you know, I think I think there's there, there's many things we can do. Um, uh, one is right, um, embracing and showing love for for the the students that are here, um, but also in our own um, our own recruitment efforts um, in terms of, of faculty, in terms of graduate students, um, in terms also of undergraduate students. But some of the places um, that have some resources, right? Um, my um, my graduate seminars at, at Michigan State are usually half or more than half students of color um, because of the work that, that many of us do, um, but also because um, of the work we do um, recruiting students and supporting them when they're uh -huh. here. 
because we've done a really good job of recruiting international students. Yeah, <laughs> we have that's a, right. An increasingly large population of international students, but it seems ironic to me that we are now prohibited in many ways from doing some kind of overt uh, recruiting on the basis of race. And so, because of the, new, the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative, it's made it's made it more difficult, and that is a problem. We used to have specific outreach programs, and right. we, you know, some of those went by the wayside. Right. We, I mean, you know, for instance, in the College of Education, with something like the Urban Teacher Cohort Program, right, is 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 a way of, of, of possibly not naming race, um, right. uh, um, overtly, but um, but caring about race and people of color and communities of color and recruiting teachers of color, yes, and um, and supporting um, teachers of color and their white colleagues um, in in, uh, in in stating that commitment early and then being supported in that commitment through their education. One of the other things that I liked was that a few years ago I attended some free seminars that the university held in the summer, which was how to deal with issues of diversity in large and small classes, because the dynamics can be very different. I teach a class of 260 students, I also teach classes of 18, and so the dynamics are very different. And many professors uh, feel uncomfortable allowing the issue of race to come up for fear they'll lose control, they won't know what to do, they don't have any strategies and tactics to help. And I thought it was wise of the university to offer these free classes, but I was surprised that they were not terribly well attended. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be a bigger infrastructure support for professors to show them that it is actually enriching in the classroom when you have these discussions. You deepen the understanding and the critical thinking of your students if you have these discussions. It's not something to be avoided, but you have to make them feel comfortable to do that. Well, and you also have to acknowledge that they won't feel comfortable. <laughs> oh, well, there's that too, yes. And that the discomfort is part of the learning, that that dissonance is, is critical to to understanding and to critical thinking. Yes. And, so, and the reality is that you have students of color who aren't comfortable in classes, and so it's yes. about only certain a certain group of people are feeling comfortable. Yes. And that race is happening, it's just not being named. And so that's the other part of it too. You know, I was just going to say, in terms of the open letter of love um, to black students, one of the things that's been um, amazing is to see the over thousand, you know, black professors that have now signed the letter um, from across the country, from across institutions, everywhere from Juilliard to Michigan State to Stanford to community colleges, right, um, liberal arts colleges, um, and then the student response. Um, and, and I think one of the things about the, this, this huge response, you know, over 5,000 shares on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, wow. um, is that um, some of the stuff that's named in the letter, right, um, uh, is often um, named between us as, as black faculty, black students, um, people of color, but not um, always um, named publicly um, for many of the reasons also stated in the letter. And so, um, so I, f I feel like uh, there, there's, uh, there's some core experiences um, that resonated um, yes. across disciplines, right? You have engineers signing it, you have um, English professors signing it, you have um, that, um, that many people have, kind of have, have said to Ray in their responses. Do you want to... Yeah, I received an email today and that said, I mean pretty much what a lot of the emails have said, thank you for putting into words what we all feel. Thank you for putting into words what we say behind closed doors. Yes. Um, an, one email from a woman who's involved in a lawsuit uh, around discrimination. Another from a woman who was threatened with a noose and who talked about the way the faculty, the black faculty and students are traumatized. Um, the earliest emails was just this simple email that said thank you from the bottom of my raging heart. Oh. And, which I felt captured so much of what everyone was feeling. Um, and and again, I didn't I didn't think it was going to have this impact. And um, do you want to talk about? I'm glad to see that there is this emotional component and that it's not just clinical policy issues. Oof. You know, because uh, I mean, on the one hand, there's a side of me that wants to say, let's have clear-cut benchmarks so that this doesn't just dissipate. I was so fond of what was happening with Wall uh, with Occupy. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult to look at specific changes that were made and we need to articulate some things we'd like to see. Are there specific things you'd also like to see happen even on our campus at MSU? There are, but I think, I mean, what was critical to the letter was that this was from black faculty to yeah. black students. This yeah. wasn't about explaining anything to white people right. at all. Um, I like what Chris Rock said. <laughs> he said, the problem's never been black people, the problem's white people. <laughs> 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 we're the ones that haven't made any progress since 1950. <laughs> 
And so I, another response, I get emails from people who are not black, um, who are white, or other people of color who, who are asking how they can show their support. And so there are white professors who are working on letters of solidarity. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that has happened because of this letter, which wasn't planned, was that there are conversations that are happening um, between faculty um, in colleges that weren't necessarily happen happening before. And so I think that's one thing, just that that daily communication that you have with the person who's in the office next to you um, is an important thing. And then there are those broader institutional things of who who are we bringing in? How right. are we, how are we retaining? Are we bring, yeah. How are we retaining faculty? Are yeah. we? Um, um, how are we retaining students? Um, things like that. One strategy from the '60s that I would love to see revised is the teaching, because I thought mm -hmm. those were wonderful. They were outside the classroom experiences where the clock didn't matter. You didn't have to leave because it was five minutes out and you had to rush to the next class. And there were opportunities for people to share stories. Uh, town hall is a great framework, but so also is teaching. There's a historic thrust here right. that I think is very hard for young people to fully appreciate. You know, Bill is working on an initiative uh, to try to capture some of the uh, the history of what happened with the civil rights movement mm -hmm. here in Lansing. We have, you know, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Martin Luther King's speech here on campus, and those are things like this. So mm -hmm. I would love to see that our educational uh, institutions in the community accept that challenge to start teaching more of that history. Mm -hmm. Angela, you had your site for Malcolm X. Yes, um, and I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for writing a letter today because it speaks to the student that I was in 1989 mm -hmm. and 1986. It's the letter that I wish I had received when we were sitting in and sleeping in on campus. Um, and we didn't get that support, so thank you for that, because it touches me and it heals something that has been broken ever since. Thank you. No, you're welcome. And that's another thing I'm hearing from a lot of black women professors have told me, I'm putting this on my office door. <laughs> one black woman in Germany <laughs> and so the idea and I remember when I was an undergrad and I was taking a class with June Jordan um, I remember her describing her office door and the importance of her office door and what she put on the outside of her door and I was thinking about as an undergrad if I'd seen that um, what that would mean so thank you absolutely yeah my earliest experience at U of M I'm gonna go ahead and call it out because they're at four percent students um, of black students four percent now since the time I, I really feel like I was student zero that mm -hmm. created the civil rights initiative I felt like I was the person that she was talking about because it was right at the time that I was there ready mm -hmm. to graduate and I yeah. felt like everyone around is looking at me like I don't belong here even to the point as a freshman going into that lecture hall with 300 people yes. and sitting down in the front row because I'm eager and I'm mm -hmm. just so excited yeah. about my education and being focused and having the person next to me say how dare you sit next to me <gasps> that's how I was welcomed Angela, those are the kinds of stories that I wish we had another hour to go, and I would like to invite the same panel back. <laughs> we're we're going to keep doing this till we get it right. <laughs> and I, I want to say one thing. I just yeah. want to honor your your work and your presence because it's it's that work that makes it possible for us all to be here. So just. You know, we love you. Oh, oh I mean, we are going to have a group hug now, so because <laughs> this is LCC Radio WLNZ eighty nine point seven. I'll have to get that in. Ray Paris, Angela Austin, uh, Waters Austin, and uh, Deanna Harden, and I don't have your first name. It's Django Paris. Thank you. We will see you next Monday night at seven p.m. There we go. That takes the sliders down. I have to be careful because. If I don't do that, it still goes out. <laughs> 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 <laughs>